So, good morning. In fact, I believe I'm being tracked. I think it, this thing does actually move. You shouldn't have told me that. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. This is a non-technical talk, which is unusual for me. Um, for those coming on the workshop, Thursday, Friday, we do technology then, but the request this morning was to do something a little broader. So I, I gave myself what in hindsight is a rather daunting title, Making Progress, Achieving Change, How Do Studies Make a Difference and How Do We Not Waste Time? And three months ago, that was a great idea. This weekend, I was thinking, what did I think? But I want to share that with you. Um, I'm based in uh, Scotland. That's where our office is. That's where Trax Training works from, Scotland, which is part of the UK, for avoidance of doubt. Uh, UK is part of Europe, for the avoidance of doubt. We have to clarify these days. <laughs> My background is, is now most, mostly in training, but a lot of it's been project work. And looking back over, over that project work, some of it was great, and some of it was a complete waste of time. Really was a waste of time. And that plays to the sort of things you, you're involved in, because there's, there's one thing I'm absolutely sure you don't want to do, and that's waste time during studies. So in this introductory talk, it is a, um, it's looking at the reasons why some things have worked and others don't. Um, if I can jump to the conclusion, it's not the technology. It's much more about behavior and about people and the way we go about it. And so I'll share those with you, share some thoughts with you. Think of this, if you like, as, you are a, as the pre-lunch warm-up act, and then this afternoon it's all technology right till the end. So what I'd like to do, um, five things. The first one, just touch a little bit on research ob objectives, uh, something close to, very close to your heart, really about value and delivery, um, a, a little bit about effective projects, and I'll share a model, a very, very simple model, which will be very familiar to many of you. And then I want to pick two cases, one, one of failure, a real failure case and then a success case. And I'm going to reach back into my Shell past here. So I'm, I'm aware there's a poke from Shell in the audience, so I should be clear. Uh, I do not speak for Shell, and, uh, and I'm sure it's all fine now. Um, <laughs> but let's face it, the, the, these experiences are not particular to Shell. They, it could be any company, but they're two which are quite big. They were informative years for me, um, and they're both published, so we can talk about them. Uh, getting failure cases to take to conferences is quite difficult. People like sharing successes. It's quite difficult to say, can I take that project you did? Because it was such a failure, and I really want to tell everyone about it. <laughs> um, they tend not to share. So the only way is to use your own stuff, because um, failure, I'd like to think I've got a certain expertise in that area. <laughs> so for when it fails, I'll take the case of Cormorant, and there's one person in this room who was there at the time, um, which is an example of failing slowly and painfully. Then one that's a success case, which again is a shell one, which is Omar and LNG, uh, which is somewhat quicker. And then just finish with um, trying to distill some of the ingredients of success from, uh, from a book that wasn't bought for me before the summer, but if I'd have had that book, it would have made this a lot easier. But I'll, I'll just put those ideas out there. And it's about creating space for creative genius, which is easy to say, much harder to do. And I'll just make a quick relationship between Pink Floyd, Half Dan, and a conversation I had in Harry at Watt University last week, which for me are completely related and connected things, and I'll try and illustrate why. <laughs> OK, so research objectives. Well, you, you have a website, and I, I know the person who writes it. Clear objectives, clear objectives. Um, this comes straight from your website uh, this weekend, and the nice little thing about sending, sending ideas. Very clear indeed. Um, we had the pleasure of uh, Bo's company three years ago. Was it right at the beginning? Must have been, yeah, three years ago. In Aberdeen for two weeks, when this was all just starting, and you came and joined us for two weeks and sat with some of the consultants and just talked about some of the issues, and it was, an, it was an excellent two weeks. And eventually, of course, we got a bit curious about what this technology centre was. And you asked Bo, you know, so wh what actually is it? I mean, is there a building out there in Denmark? Is it just you, or is, it, is there a building with people? In? He said, yeah, you've got a building, and you've got funding, and funding was pretty impressive. And, and it's full of people, and I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was along the lines of, uh, that's the next thing. And then we were, we just, we, our heart went out to you, I suppose, because we suddenly realised, you know, this is um, actually just leaving the car park and stepping onto the path, and there's an absolute mountain to be climbed here. Um, because the money comes with a promise, as I've discovered in my years of consultancy. You don't just get money to play with, you're actually sort of supposed to do something. Um, and if the larger the sum of, the sum of money, the, the bigger the promise. And an office with no one in it, it was quite a daunting, daunting, uh, daunting place to start. So it's a particular pleasure to be here now, three years later, and see a room full of researchers. Um, when we talked about the, the aim, improving recovery, the immediate question was, do you mean recovery or, 
or recovery factor. And that when you say things like that to a, a geologist, that's a, a very dangerous thing, because they just thought, well, this is really quite easy. There's an easy way and a hard way. And the easy way, well, do we mean recovery factor? Well, I can fix that in a heartbeat. And I think the numbers we worked out, if you increase the recovery factor by 1%, there's a multiple of oh, it's tens and tens and tens compared to the cost of the research centre. And, and I really can do that in a heartbeat. I mean, just give me a calculator. All you have to do is reduce the stoic, and your recovery factor will go up neatly. And, you know, 1%, well, that's well within the rounding error. I, we, I can, we can do that in seconds. I can charge you a euro for that. That's, that's as long as it will take. So the first easy way is delusion, uh, fiddling the numbers. Um, if this seems a sort of a superficial thing to say, there is one major international oil company. It's not in Denmark. But I've got to say, it's not that far away. And they do use recovery factor as their metric for success. And I can only assume the stoops in that company are just going down, 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 down as they push the recovery factor up, 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 up. It's all going to end badly. Anyway, this is just to do with um, definitions. I take it as read that the Technology Centre solved this right at the beginning. It's not recovery factor, it's recovery. There's still an easy way and a hard way, though. And an easy way, the other easy way, if we assume that delusion's out of the question, uh, an easy way is gradualism, uh, which is actually quite common, I think. Um, you have a problem and you say, OK, let's take the data and let's start modelling. Um, modelling is a very, uh, you can get lost in modelling. Um, it's a subject close to my heart for over the years, and that's the topic for the end of this week. There's a feeling that you're making progress, you're making a model, you can see everything. Um, the time passes, as it always does with modelling, and uh, then things change. And you look back, if after a year or two, you look at has the recovery changed. Uh, it's probably changed a bit, because it's bound to. If you're smart, you reframe the objectives slightly compared to what you have in your models. And you say, OK, there's a bit of improvement, and you use that as a basis for asking for more money. Uh, so goes almost every university in the world, and uh, plenty of other research institutes as well. It's just slow progress. And uh, if I can just a quick word on modelling, we will talk about this at the end of the week. Uh, model modelling is, is great technology, but it's not an answer uh, by any means. Uh, one of the things said in Shell when I was there, because um, I was involved in marketing, modelling internally, was that the 1980s gave us 3D seismic, and then the 1990s gave us horizontal drilling, and then the next big technology is going to be reservoir modelling. And I looked at that and I thought, that's absolutely not true. Um, 3D seismic is absolute data. Horizontal drilling is absolute production, if you do it right. Modelling, it's just a picture. It's just a reflection of what's in your mind. It's a very different thing. Nothing wrong with modelling, but it's easy to get lost in it, and it's easy to uh, resemble progress where, where actually no progress is being made at all. But gradually you can sort of get there. Well, that, that, I think that's the easy way. That's what we can fall into. What's being aspired to here, I hope, or well, I'm sure, and what we want is something much, much harder. You actually want to change the game completely. These are the kind of things that Patrick was just talking about. Uh, that has to do with things like inspiration, which we all know about and we experience now and again, but it's hard to control. It means actually managing the creative moment, which is creative genius, if you really, really do it. <laughs> I'm tracking that table. I just want you to know. <laughs> And the hardest thing for us is that it's all very well having creative genius, but you have to deliver an engineering result because that promise has been made. And the balance between the two, uh, Rasmus, you touched on that immediately in your introduction. Uh, achieving those two, that's not trivial because there's, there's a balancing act to be made there. And that is the hard, the hard, that is the hard thing to do. But that's what we want to do. So that's on research. One way of looking at it, and I thought I'd start with this is technology. It's a graph. It's a simple one. Um, and for anyone who's been involved in this, we used to use these in, when I was in shell research, we used these. You'll be familiar with this, these kind of S-curves or something similar. So it's just a graph of time along the bottom, and then the, the percentage of the project complete, whether it succeeds or fails, it's just how far through are you. And you get a sort of an S-curve, and you know, we talked about the bit at the bottom where you have the ideas, the bit in the middle where you build the hopefully great products, and the bit at the end when you deliver and then apply it. And my word, it's so easy to say that, isn't it? <laughs> And it's easy to draw that. And at, at that time, in um, shell research at least, the, the observation was that you know we're, there's absolutely no shortage of this stuff. Um, there's some of this. But then when it comes to delivering and applying it, you know, actually that doesn't really turn people on quite so much. And sort of, you know, maybe something's made it, something's didn't. And there was a huge amount of effort at that time 
to go all the way up the curve and get to the end. Now, I'm absolutely sure, well, I know that's exactly what your centre is all about with the technical readiness levels, one to seven, and you go one to three, and the whole idea of those and the interface with uh, operators of, is, of course, to make sure you get to seven and actually do something. But not trivial. And for those of you who have done this before or seen these things or are some of the more experienced folk who look back on their careers, you'll realise that, well, it wasn't a line to start with, but it's not even curvilinear. Much more like this, where you have your idea number one, and then you <coughs> not such a great idea, so you have idea number one A, and things improve a little bit, and you just about get yourself off the ground, you know, off the floor, so you, and then the whole thing fails, and you've used half the money. Um, and then you have idea two, and then it looks a bit good, and then there's a bit of a rush, and finally the product emerges. It's much more like that. And managing that is not, not, not an easy process. Um, if I can look inwards, you know, I'd like to share the example of my own PhD, in my word. Um, <laughs> I'm so proud. I'm so proud. I had a very happy time in Wales. You know, great idea. I've got a PhD. I'm off. Great idea. No, actually, no, I haven't got any idea at all. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, no, now I do. Now I have a really great idea. I'm going to run with it. And here it is. Can you see the progress? Look at that. <laughs> Making good progress. And then... No, that's all hopeless. That wasn't a good idea. And then uh, we were in our 20s, and of course you are at university, so then there's a bit of romance. And this is a really good thing. And you're very, very happy, but it's very bad for the project, because it was going badly anyway. And now you're barely turning up in the department. Uh, and then I like to just point out the possibility of going below the line. That's when you are now, you now have less than you did at the beginning. Um, and at that point, that's when the supervisors intervene. And, and that's, that's the bit that really pushes you under, underwater. You really have lost all hope of living. Um, and then it comes together. And you do that one thing that we all do to save big projects, especially when it's very important, uh, we panic. And then it's, there's an enormous amount of effort, a massive effort. And I'd like to say you land neatly like a cloud landing on a hill, but you don't. It's more like a car smashing into a wall really quickly. <laughs> but you get there, you submit, and uh, OK, you're just a little bit late. <laughs> the only thing I can think about with my PhD, the, what, all I learned, I mean, the rocks, I didn't know if that's ever going to be used, but I learned never to do that again. Working in oil and gas, I've seen as relatively simple since then. <laughs> so effective projects. You can map all these projects onto that curve. And I, I'm going to suggest that. Now, that was all sort of good, good advice for, you know, if it was three years ago when nothing was happening. But three years have happened here. I'm sure you've had these kind of conversations. I saw this, which isn't there to read. It's just a screen grab from your own material that was shared with me before, before coming here. That speaks of process and delivery. I'm sure you can talk it through if you need to in detail. And I'm sure it's not perfect. But this, this looks nothing like my PhD, that's for sure. We're halfway up the hill now. Um, the harder task now now it's coming to delivery, is how do you keep the inspiration and the creative moment there when actually you've just got to deliver, 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 deliver on some promises. And I genuinely think that's much harder. It was easier at the beginning because it's all blue sky. Now, now it's a mixture. So the hard part, I think, is this part in the middle. Yeah. I, I don't think, looking back, and feel free to disagree with this one, but I don't think there's any shortage of ideas, not, not, not with a group like this, um, any university group any company research group, that there's always ideas. And to be honest, there's always application. We do work with engineers, you know, you know, Maersk, Shell, all the others, you know, the, these are engineers. Engineers are actually quite good at delivering, not always on time, not always on budget, but you get delivery. Uh, the hard part, I think, to get right is in here. And my, my assertion, or my offering, shall we suggest, it's on the steep part of the curve here that success or failure happens, I think. Uh, and it can go either way. We always have ideas, we always have some delivery, but whether there's complete failure at the end, sort of, I think it's what happens on this steep part of the curve. And that's where we need to keep the inspiration. That's hard. By way of illustration, failure is just a great thing. I don't know why we don't do more of it. It's a cliche, but you know, when we fail, we have the opportunity to learn. Uh, we learn from successes, but we, we certainly learn from failures. They stick with us <coughs> much longer. It is in all the timing, though. Um, we're very familiar with this one, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. That was a, I mean, it's still quite breathtaking how that actually, how on earth, how on earth did that happen? The one where they got the mirror wrong, I do like this. It's an old Larson cartoon, that moment when you finally discover extraterrestrial life and you're taking a photo and the aliens are waving, but it's sort of a bit fuzzy because you got the mirror wrong, you know. That's failure at the, at the end. 
that, that, that was too late, and of course the costs were astronomical. If they fixed it, you know, they made fixing it a technical success, but uh, at, at a massive cost. And it's the same for oil and gas. It's not just people like this. Um, a wonderful example, two, $2 billion worth of happiness there floating up into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there it is, just about ready to be commissioned, point of maximum exposure on the project, and then that was it. And that wasn't Katrina. That was uh, interesting in that company, how it's now related to Katrina. It wasn't Katrina. It was a couple of weeks different. That was just a mistake. That, that was just a failure. Yeah. And it got fixed at immense cost. But that's the point of maximum, in terms of petroleum economics, the time of maximum exposure, maximum economic exposure on the project. That happened. So failing is OK, um, but you've got to get your timing right. And I know I've heard the expression fail fast. There's at least one person in this room who uses it in the, at the centre. Uh, there, there really is something about failing fast, absolutely. Uh, not, not saving up your failures till the end. So. Two examples, contrasting examples. One, the, the, the failure case. This is a, the brilliant Cormorant study, which I'm proud to have been involved with. I'd, I'd only been in the industry a few years, working on a North Cormorant uh, subsurface. And again, as at least one person in this room knows personally, North Cormorant was famous. Uh, it's famous because it was, it's basically full of faults, heavily faulted, and you couldn't really see them on seismic. That's the brief. That's the brief. So the analogue for that, I went back and found this outcrop earlier this year. Uh, this is one we went to, which is seen as a small-scale example of what North, we thought North Cormorant really looked like, a big master fault. And then in the hanging wall on the right here, a pile of other faults. And with that particular outcrop, you can, if you blow it up, you can spend a lot of time sketching. That was a quick one done yesterday. It's basically full of faults. And on the principle of scale invariance with uh, shear fracture systems, the same sort of geometries were happening on a kilometre scale. So, easy way, hard way. This isn't really a shell comment, it's the same in all companies, but it was particularly case, the case there. Um, let's make a model. So I made a model. So a very old one now, um, happily published. Although old, um, at the time, it was leading edge technology. Um, it used the curvilinear grid. It was full field, which is just a full field curvilinear grids at the time were about the limit of what you could do with computing power. We had some new seismic in there. That was reinterpreted. Um, we set transmissibility multipliers using a secret formula. And I was told it was a secret, although how you can make a secret out of the inverse square law, I don't know. But anyway, well, the secret's out now, I've told you. <laughs> just to say, don't say it's squared. You mustn't say it's squared, Mark. OK, 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 I won't say You know, smoke screen. But I did that, and it was done cell by cell across the model. And I just, for those of you who are young in the audience, by young I mean under 50, I just want to make the point that um, there was a time when there was no Excel spreadsheets. There was, we, that we did actually work without Excel. Yeah, we didn't have PowerPoint. We barely did email during the day. It, by comparison, we certainly had no social network. You must actually wonder, you know, I wonder what we actually did to fill our time during the day at work, you know. I think probably we actually did some work, if I, if I, think, if I really think back carefully. We had, no, we had none of that. So uh, to do this, um, just to give you an idea, the, uh, what you had to do was make a table with every single cell-cell connection, and even with like 30,000 cells. That's a lot of connections. I'm looking at Henrik here. That's a lot of connections between cells. And then hand calculate on a table the, uh, the transmissibility multipliers using the secret formula. And then you write pages and pages and pages of tables. Then you get a temp in the office who has to then type them all in. Uh, and it took weeks, it took absolutely weeks. We spent 18 man months on this, 18 man months, building this model for this layer and the number of layers below it, and uh, shell colours, red is showing you where the oil is. The whole point was the, uh, the objective was to try and spot some infill wells. Yeah, that's what we were trying to do. So 18 months goes by, um, and then we're ready. And we go to the chief petroleum engineer's room, and he was a decent guy. Uh, he had no way, realistically, of having any idea of what we'd done. I mean, he did email. Just. Just. He had no clue what was behind that model or all those little multipliers. I mean, he basically had to take it on trust. Uh, but he was the one in, you know, authority. So he said, um, you know, well, he's the decider. He's the one with the pen who can put a cross on the map. So we lay all these down and said, well, where do you want to drill? Uh, and there was a number of maps. And he says, well, you know, I think we should drill the red areas. Good choice, boss. You know, <laughs> that 30 years in the industry wasn't wasted. 
um, which one of the red areas do you think you want to go for, boss? And he said, oh, well, let's go for the biggest. <laughs> Good choice, boss. Let's do that. So we did. And we put a cross on the map and then spent, even then, what, 15 million pounds, dollars, something like that. Uh, and we drilled, in, we, we drilled in there and we hit a sub-seismic fault. Quite a big one. It had a dis sub seismic, it had a displacement of 200 feet. Well, the reservoir is only just over 200 feet thick. So, what we got was a well through a damage zone. It never produced a barrel. The well was junked, as was all of the study. Now, I want to point out this was a very, very good study. Uh, we took this, this was uh, technical leading edge stuff. It was absolutely the best you could do. Uh, took it to the annual conference at Shell, won a prize. I was pretty happy about that. Because of that, I got to go to a conference. So I went to the APG, um, won a prize. Pretty happy with that, because then you get rolled onto the SPE. So I went back to the SPE. I basically, I got three conferences out of this. And, uh, you know, some business class travel. And I'd not been a student that long before. <laughs> so I was actually pretty happy. And this was lauded as, 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 you know, a piece of technical excellence. There really was only one problem with this work. And that is that the whole thing was fundamentally useless. <laughs> Absolutely useless in many, many ways, yeah? The principal one being that we spent $15 million and we drilled a hole here, hit a sub seismic fault and never produced a barrel. <coughs> now we came out the back of that study and folks said, um, what surprised me is that I thought people would get sacked because oil and gas is a ruthless cutthroat business. And actually folks said, you know, it's happened again. You know, we're always hitting faults in this field when we never know where they are. And you can probably guess what the recommendation was, obviously, you know, make a new model. And you thought, at the time, the conference, what was said in the corridor, I remember one person specifically, one of the reservoir engineers saying, look, okay, you can't do better than your best guess. We did the best we could possibly do, better than Exxon, which I think was the real reason. You know, so you can go into the partner meeting and say, look, ha, you know, off you go. And I thought, is that really true when you're so catastrophically wrong? And um, before we did anything else. I went and just, I just, as a matter of interest, went to get all of the seismic interpretations ever done on the field and just overlaid them all on a light table. Remember light tables? Uh, and you got this. So what that is is a picture, that's a picture of every fault that had ever, ever been picked in that field by the seven geophysicists who worked on this since first oil. And I thought, okay, this took 18 months. This took a week to get that data together and make the, make the image. Which one contains the most information? And I suppose this is a close to big data. You know, surely that is the representation of what's going on. We know it basically says we know there's faults and we know we don't know where they are. <laughs> now make a decision, now decide whether you're going to drill. What we'd done here was modelled ourselves into a position where we thought we knew what was going on when we didn't really. We made models to support a decision that someone had already really made. If we look back on that, we thought that the best effort we could make was indeed the best that could be done. By doing your technical best, you're doing the best because no one else can do any better. Well, not if you're that catastrophically wrong and can predict it. You're better to do nothing. You're better to go and do something else or do it differently. We certainly avoided any sense of uncertainty. There was no uncertainty analysis. Um, there was absolutely no attempt to define risks. Um, I think looking back and what would embarrass me on this, we, we, we genuinely thought we were doing a really good job. You know, and that was reinforced by our own chiefs and uh, at the centre who said this is great, go to conferences, show the shell technology. And there's nothing wrong with the technology, it's just the way we're using it. Uh, we were, the my phrase of the uh, year or the last two years, we were modelling for comfort. Uh, someone wanted to drill some wells and they wanted some modelling to back them up and so we provided exactly that which is actually pretty much the worst thing you can do with modelling, back to modelling, and we'll talk about that on Thursday, Friday. We should model perhaps for discomfort rather than for comfort. In terms of process though and behaviour, over the 18 <coughs> months of that work, the work was never questioned. No one intervened. Right at the beginning, it was decided the work would be done, and off we went, and we did it. And the decision was made, but it was never questioned or checked. It was a world away from the kind of process, and, and everyone has their own process, but the one sort of um, Richard Noxlade and I talk a lot about in, in tracks is this sort of fourth rail bridge model. So the, there's a linear, this isn't big loop, closing loop, this is a bit different, this is just, you know, there's a linearity about time, and uh, this, uh, the bridge is a metaphor for ways of team behaving. You know, you go off and the team does some stuff, and then you come together. 
and you really look at it hard. And then you go off and you do something different and then you come together. And you pre be prepared at these nodes to maybe completely jack it in or at least to completely change before you get to the end result. And that, that just wasn't happening at all here. It was a question of failing slowly. And the ultimate failure was at the end when you drill the well and everything was lost, including, I mean, I had a great time. I just want to point that out. The, the conferences were great. I learned a lot. And we got a cleaned up database. Um, but absolutely worthless study. Absolutely worthless study. Yeah, worst case scenario. OK, something more cheerful. Let's go to beautiful Oman, uh, where I had the pleasure of working for a few years. This is the Oman LNG, which is, um, which is quite a big deal. Um, uh, financially, well, you're, you're instantly, instantly into the billions. And we were writing the field development plan. This was a totally different set of behaviours. Um, the picture I would draw for that looked something like this. So if we go to our, our projects, again, it's not neat. It wasn't necessarily pretty, but it had a key ingredient, and that was early failure, uh, and a few of them, actually. So again, we used best technical tools, uh, as usual, as you would, as one would hope. We started to do things, and we did some things which are really not that good. Uh, and basically, it got to a point where we got to a node on that bridge, and we were told by pretty senior people in the technical people in Shell that we were wrong. Um, for me, there was Flora Hill, who gets referred to on many times, basically told me all of our models were rubbish, and that was an inspirational moment I take with me. Um, another chap called Stuart Evans, very well respected, as was Flora. Just uh, we came up with all sorts of clever ideas and statistics. Geostatistics was new. We said we've got statistical solutions for where we should drill. We've, got, we've thought of all sorts of clever things and presenting, we were presenting, presenting, presenting in The Hague to these silent rooms. Uh, and then Stuart, he just says, you know, can't believe you're doing that. That's, uh, it's the wrong way. And we're completely stunned by that because a uh, big project, relatively high profile. The team of three, we were relatively young in the industry. We only had 15 years between us, but you're writing the FDP for quite a big scheme, and, uh, and your own leadership, you know, a year into this and you've been told you're just completely wrong, start again, tear it up. And that was very, very tough, very, very tough. But the guidance was brilliant. Um, the guidance, and it was Stuart Evans, I remember very well, he just said, you know, you need to do scenarios. And we said, okay, what's a scenario? And he says, I don't know but I'm going to come and review you in six months. So you've got six months to work it out. And then he went back to the airport and left us on our own. And what came out of that then, having been sort of reasonably battered and bruised, what came out of that then was uh, scenarios. And the whole thing of scenarios, which we've dined out on for many years since, all this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, there's a number of people thinking about it at Shell at that time, but this, this became the place where it got tried. Uh, and we lived it. We lived it for a year. And it was great. And it was completely not what we intended to, to do at the beginning. It, it was completely coming from outside. So we did scenarios. We basically found out what it was. And, or we found a way of working. We found a solution. And it was, became a team-based thing. Now, the behaviors in that team between here, where it was hopeful, and then pretty dismal, not as dismal as my PhD, but pretty dismal, you were able to turn it around and carry on. And, and looking back, that was the moment when you really hit the curve steeply and there are some behaviors that went with that which we were unaware of at the time um, but that's what I want to break down now because that contrasts completely with the cormorant case yeah when we got up on the top here suddenly it was one of those wonderful moments where suddenly it feels like you can do anything and you're doing things new and you're doing it again and again and again and it I only had that for a couple of years in my time at Shell but when it happened it, it was a wonderful thing and that's the moment that I can imagine you're trying to seize here in the center. So what were the, um, and I'm, again, experienced folk in the audience, you can probably write all these from your own successes and failure cases, but if I look back on that one, I can share my own reflections on that. We were smart enough. You know, you don't, this is not about raw intelligence. Absolutely not. Um, everyone in this room is smart enough to come up with the next brilliant idea in oil and gas that will change the world. So absolutely no question. We're all smart enough. We, we tend to forget how heavily screened we are. Just a bit. I take everyone, everyone was screened before they came in? Yeah, the stupid ones are outside, thank you. Yeah, we're all smart enough. We're all, we're all smart enough. It's, it's not the raw intelligence, it's how we use it. That, that, that's absolutely the thing. We had inspired advisors, 
uh, at least two, but there were others who were great as well, but two who were prepared to tell us we were completely wrong and force us to listen. We were definitely open to experimentation. We didn't mind trying things. There was sort of an attitude there. We were persistent and we were al aligned, and, th and that was true. We were determined to write this field development plan. There was no exiting, there was no alternative. We were going to do it. And because we were all equal in that team, um, we just naturally did it together. And once you've been fired on by some fairly heavy guns, I mean, there's nothing to bring a team together than people who start shooting at you. I mean, unless you lose one or two along the way. Um, it, it, does, it does draw you together. I don't know if you do this, but I can, you know, just, just take shots now and again, it'll be all right. You know. Well, actually, one of two things can happen, but okay, there's plenty of people in the room. It brought you together. We, we were able to take advice, um, and that's not necessarily true of everyone, of people like us, partly because we've been quite successful at university or in, in early careers. We don't always take advice. So getting yourself in a position where you can take advice, that made a big difference. And the other thing is that we, were very, we became very, very confident once we had started to get successes, but never, I would say, never too confident. Um, when, it, when it's pure confidence, then it goes wrong again. Uh, there was still a little bit of humility that we were waiting. In fact, you were sort of inviting the criticism in. to so, say, you know, what could we possibly have missed? And I think if we have the eye on the target and think of it as our own money, I mean, this was a $9 billion scheme. There was going to be a day, yes or no, when you made the decision. If it was your $9 billion, yeah, I think I would ask people, Am I about to lose it all? So confident, but not so confident that you stopped asking questions. Um, again, I think it was uh, Patrick who said, you know, it's that thing about asking questions. Asking questions is, 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 is a huge thing. This is from me. I just want to compare it with somebody from, um, someone who's really studied this, Tetlock and Gardner. Um, it's a book two years ago, Super Forecasters. They, um, Tetlock was the guy who did big, big studies in the States, Pennsylvania. Uh, working out whether judgment was good or bad, and uh, huge, huge studies. And he was able to show there was a very poor correlation between our forecasts and our expertise, which people loved. This book uh, was one he wrote uh, because he said, well, actually, I slightly regret some of that first work because um, it turns out, statistically, there are some people who are s systematically good at forecasting, and I, I think more than just forecasting, and I can, I can spare you reading the book. You only, read, you only need to read the last page, and it comes down to four words, and I've written them here. So you don't need to read the book unless, unless you want to. Uh, it's a bit wordy. But the conclusions I thought was brilliant. It was a portrait of the people who are really capable of forecasting. Uh, uh, if it's a smaller group, I'd be tempted to ask you what you think those characters might be. Well, unless anyone wants to throw it out there. What makes a good forecaster? Communication. Communication, yeah. Any other thoughts? There's a brilliant one which I'm going to finish on. Experience. experience. Funnily enough, not so much experience, because um, they learn it. They learn it. So actually, it was almost like a taxi driver commenting on Al Qaeda or something like that. Um, in fact, I think the suggestion was experience can lead you astray because you get confident. <laughs> so not, so, not so much experience. Ignorance? Yes, there we're, we're getting there now. Here we go. First one was open minded. Second one was careful, careful being not saying, I know the answer. It's just, well, hang on, let's really think about the question. System two of Kalman and Tversky. The third one was curious, people who just want to know, which is, why the, which is what was replacing experience, really. It was just focus at, oh, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about it. I am going to think through it carefully. But the last one, this one I really like, they were self-critical people. And then I reflected on everyone I've worked with in oil and gas over the last 27 years. I thought, OK, let's put them in containers, the ones who are truly self-critical and the ones who weren't nearly self-critical enough. And I'll leave it to you to decide how much was in each container. Uh, oil and gas doesn't generate people who are naturally self-critical. I think it's my observation. If you think about it, that, that is a portrait of the people you'd like to have as your partners to work with. I mean, if you fill a team full of these people, <coughs> I mean, I think back to the team we had here, uh, Roland Gelling and Bart van der Leenput, who've both done very well for themselves. I think Bart's running Holland now, something like that. You know, actually, that, that was common personality traits of the group, common personality traits. That helped find the moment. And it uh, doesn't happen all the time, but when you're in a team like that, you don't go far wrong. If we can do something to encourage people to be more like that, then we multiply our performance, I'm absolutely sure. <coughs> and as a reflection, we're coming towards lunch now.
just three quick reflections. That those were two cases from oil and gas. Um, it's the same in other industries. So I want to share a near emotional moment for you. This is the Victoria and Albert Museum. This London, summer. There was a retrospective. Now, we're talking about musical taste here, so let's not go there. I just want to just want to say <laughs> that uh, whatever your feelings about the music, clearly this was a very successful band. Yeah, they had a, they had a moment of success, and the. Uh, it was a fantastic retrospective, actually. They laid it out uh, basically chronologically, and you go room to room, and you basically walk through the guy's life. Um, so the whole thing was a metaphor for life. Um, but what you're waiting for, you know, as you're walking through it, I was fascinated by how did that happen? How come, how come four people managed to make one album, which, okay, not everyone likes, but it's some ridiculous bestseller. I mean, it's millions and millions and millions that's been sold. And this is, you know, 30, 40 years later. How did that actually happen? Because when you see the stuff right at the beginning of their career, they're just a bunch of no-hopers. And yet, that happened, that happened. How did it actually happen? And as you walk through the rooms, you can sort of see it. You can see it gradually unfolding. And if we uh, put it, uh, let's put a curve on this one. Yeah, I'll put it something like that. Although, okay, I'm gonna get in trouble with fans now because everyone will draw the curve differently, but okay, live with it, live with it. Imagine the time scale is, is not linear, but is something like this. There's the stuff at the beginning, which frankly, it, it's hard to listen to. <laughs> it is hard. You've got to really like them to listen to that stuff in the 60s. Half the audience were on drugs. They, they weren't, but I mean, the audience had to be on drugs. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't listen to that stuff. It's appalling. Um, and then there was just a glimmer of one or two things which have suddenly become, OK, you can see a hint, because you know what's coming in the middle here. You can just see a glimmer, and then uh, uh, echoes, metal, for those who are really into it. You can say, yeah, I can feel it coming, I can feel it coming. If you see the film at Pompeii, you see a picture of four people completely on fire and completely working, completely working something, and they are just about, just about to hit the best moment of their lives in terms of achievement. Uh, and then you go into the dark side of the room, room, and it's wonderful. And then it goes on. And it's not quite so good afterwards. And OK, I'm going to get in trouble with fans. There, there's, there's moments, there's moments, but it, it's never... I think we'd all agree, it's never quite the same. There was a really steep curve there where they were just perfect. And they produced something in that genre, which I might, I might not like, but in that genre, which no one had really done before and has unequivocally, empirically, stood the test of time. And I did some back reading on it as well to get some of the, uh, to read some of the back stories because uh, I really, uh, basically it's what I spent my summer doing. Um, <laughs> Because I was still curious about, well, how, 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 how do, how do you actually, how do you actually get there? And when you look to the, when you look at the, um, what was behind the dark side of the moon, you know, luck. Well, actually, okay, there's always luck in life, but this really wasn't luck. This really wasn't luck. Maybe there was a few lucky moments, but there was definitely underlying talent. But I don't think they're more talented than other musicians. It's that same thing about intelligence in the group. We're clever enough. They learn to play their instruments. Fine. There's virtuoso performers who are much better at each of the, all of those instruments than they are. But there was, when you look through it, room by room, they're experimenting, 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 experimenting. They are trying, 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 trying new things. And it's sort of rubbish, 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 quite good, quite good, not good, bit better, bit better. Endless er experimentation. Definitely a willingness to change course. Yeah, there was a lot of humility in the group early on. They were persistent and well aligned. They didn't always like each other. You don't have to like the people you work with. It does help. But if you like working with them, that's different to liking them. You know, you can go home at the end of the day. They were persistent. They were well aligned. And they, were just, they, they just tried and tried and tried. Most bands don't make it. They <coughs> fall by the wayside because it's difficult, because they can't find the hard way. Yeah? Gradualism has you in tribute bands playing other people's music. If you want a game changer, that's hard. It's persistent. They were persistent. They were well aligned. They trusted each other and respected each other. And early in the early days, they had that thing about confidence again. Confidence, but with humility. Which, and it's pretty much the only parallel I can draw between Omar and LNG and Pink Floyd. But the, in that moment, you had the team that was confident, but not so confident that they weren't a bit humble. Yeah? And they had that. And they lost it after that. <laughs> they lost the humility. Eventually, they only end up talking through their lawyers. The whole thing falls apart. And was the music great? No. But they had it there. They had that dark side of the moon moment. And that's the sort of thing we're cherishing and looking for. And, and I'm, I'm delighted that at least I had a little bit of that moment in a di completely different environment in that time in Shell. 
So to close, well, I mean, you've had it here too. It's not exactly, I mean, there's, this room is full of half damn people. So I just want to say this is more just, you know, pretty good. If you think back, you take it for granted here, I guess, now, because, uh, you know, it's half down and yeah, you've got these horizontals. Well, actually, you know, this is staggering stuff. There must have been a time down here where someone would just have one of these pictures from a, from a vendor catalogue and saying, horizontals, yeah, that might work. That's an idea. But to go from that to thinking through the stimulation options and actually putting these things in the ground, that's the steep part of the curve. And uh, when you have the delight of the 4D seismic um, at the back end, you know, fantastic. I mean, that... You can tell me later, maybe, or tell me it wasn't like that, but from a, as an outsider, there was a steep part of the curve there that, that produced something truly remarkable here in Denmark, and that was, that was half dam. Remarkable achievement. Many other countries <laughs> lacking, you know, if they could do the same thing there. And I want to finish with last week and Harriet Watt, because some of that stuff was old, so let's bring this right up to date um, to a conversation on Friday morning, uh, very early on Friday morning, actually, with... Um, there's a curve. This was a conversation about things going on there and at Imperial um, on reservoir modelling, which again, close to my heart. Uh, and by the end of the evening, we had a whole bunch of ideas on multi-scale modelling, not multi-scale, but multi-scale, but multi-surface-based um, modelling and adaptive meshes. We can talk about this on Friday or for anyone who's, who's interested. And basically that could be the solution to really understanding fluid flow and fracture zones, which we're actually very bad at. Um, reservoir engineers are okay, geologists. Poor. We're using stochastic fracture models. You should never use stochastic fracture models. Why do we use them? Actually, because there's nothing else around. And there's a solution here. You can see all the components. This is like two albums before Dark Side of the Moon. There's a pile of people working on this down at Imperial and, um, and in Harriet Watt. Plenty of people working on fracture geometries. Actually, the components are there. Uh, sticking them together, there was a strong feeling. Okay, at the end of an evening, after a bottle of wine, the feeling gets very strong. But I'm pretty sure we were there. I mean, we might have been there, we might be there. You're, you're there, and there's a bit of a curve there, and you could get up that curve in a year or two, if, if you really wanted to. <coughs> and uh, that's a thought we take back with us to Harriet Watt and Imperial in, in coming weeks. And will it be applied? Well, it, it could be, but that, that's a long way down the line. This is the kind of thing. I thought I should have at least one technical image. So this is courtesy of Imperial. This is Matt Jackson, Gary Hampson, and, and others. This is done also partly in collaboration with Harriet Watts and folk out in uh, Calgary. Adaptive meshes, but not running across, not running across two-dimensional fault planes because they're not two-dimensional. They're three-dimensional zones which have properties which can flow in three dimensions. And you can't do that on a 2D plane. Well, the whole industry actually is in this space at the moment. <coughs> it's, actually, it's actually wrong. It's actually wrong. Yeah, taking that surface-based modelling, stick it on the faults, make the fault zones, put REVs inside. We'll talk about this at the end of the week. Completely doable. Technology's there, people are there, software's just about ready. we just got to turn the surfaces around. That's all it would take. <sighs> Quite carried away. Anyway, a bit of technology before lunch. <coughs> so to close, uh, getting to the, finally getting to the top of the hill that Bo must be, you must be getting, you know, is it in sight? I hope it's in sight. You know, from where you were three years ago when it's just standing in front of Everest. <coughs> we can do the most fantastic things, but it does take certain criteria. I, I do believe very, very strongly in failure. I think that's a wonderful thing, but it's just got to happen quick and you've got to get over it. But fail, fail, big learnings associated with failing early on. So space to fail and then get on. <coughs> the big thing, that's word, those words self-critical, self-critical teams or self-critical attitude ourselves. Um, and it's hard when you've the hardest thing when you've spent three months doing something is to stand and think, have I just, is this all a load of rubbish? But uh, on, in the fourth rail bridge, noodle view of life, it's healthy. There's a need to be open to course changes. Um, that's true for Pink Floyd, Shell, AGR tracks, and others. The tricky thing is that we have to deliver. We said right at the beginning, back to Rasmus's opening point. Uh, it's all very well having ideas, but you've actually got to, you've got, you've got to get from here to here. So the the genius moment really is, I think, in here. It's not the great idea, because we all have ideas. Um, it's what comes next. It's the bit where the idea turns into something which is actually really quite good and worth running with. Open to inspiration. Absolutely, we should be open to inspiration. I think that's why we're all here the next two days. I hope everyone gets inspired by what you see on the posters and here in the talks. If there's nothing that inspires you in the next day and a half, it's got to be something wrong. There's so much stuff here. But the last one to leave you with, Confidence, confidence in what we're doing, but with humility to say, A, it might be wrong, or B, somebody else might make this better. 
Uh, that doesn't come naturally, necessarily, but that's, that's, help, that's one of the big things I think that helps us get up the curve and give us the dark side of the moon moment. Thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mark. We have a few minutes before the lunch, and so if anybody would like to ask a question, we have like five or ten minutes left. I just kindly ask you to take the microphone before you ask the question. Or share your own thought, as the other one. Share your own thought. Anybody? Okay, maybe while we wait for a question, I could ask a question. Because we saw this bridge, the railroad bridge, I think mm. you called it, where I, I understand that you sort of go each your way, and then mm. you meet and discuss, mm. and then you go your way again. And that's very much actually the, the kind of process that we are trying, kind of organization that we're mm. trying to, to build here with what we call the prototypes and the demos, where mm. we have... Do you have any experience you can share where you have done this together with academia, between industry and academia? Um, Ooh. Well, and some perspectives on that, uh, because you know some of the some of the really hairy research uh, we're working with really needs time, freedom, and so mm -hmm. on to sort of work, function, and mm -hmm. at the same time, we'd like people to come together and adjust them and share across. So maybe you have some perspectives on that. Well, I, well, I think well, I, could, I could share a couple of things. We, I mean, partly it's what Pat and I from Harriet Watt spent half of the bus journey talking about this morning. I mean, we tried something earlier this year with Tracks Training where um, we've got fed up with training courses being cancelled, you know, because the oil price is down. We have some nice courses. There was one in Provence, yeah? It's nice down there. It's on the, on, on the Schreiber. And uh, some of you have been there, I think, or you took Merce there, five groups from Merce. And, but those are getting cancelled at the moment on the grounds that they're too enjoyable. And we're getting a bit fed up because you have to book all the rooms, you have to book all the flights. And we think we were there with uh, Sebastian from Harriet Watt and others at the beginning of the year. And that was a, that was a dinner. And we just said, right, if this one gets cancelled, we'll just go. Let's just go. Everyone on this table will go. Uh, and it got cancelled the next week. And credit to Sebastian and the Harriet Watt researchers, we all went. Uh, Pat was there. And we took the research students out. And what we did, we ran an industry course. So we ran it as an industry course but they all brought their materials. And it was a week, I don't know if Pat, you may like to come because you were sort of a third party in here. Uh, we weren't sure how it would go because we thought these guys know about things like imbibition. Well, yes, but you know, there's other things they don't know about. It was actually remarkably powerful and, it, and uh, they used to be common in Harriet Watt, I think used to use, run a lot of these courses where you, you actually just get together in the field on the outcrop. It plays to the subsurface. But that essentially was a nodal moment. Um, and a whole pile of ideas came from that for us, but also for one or two of the researchers at Harriet Watt. Relatively cheaply, just spent a week together. So that, that, that one worked. Um, otherwise, we've just done them within industry studies. It, it is just a gated process, but it's not a fixed process. It's a gated attitude. Yeah. It's not a gated process, it's a gated attitude, which is different. So we just need some trips to southern France? Yeah, that's an advert, by the way. I don't know if you picked that up. Um, <laughs> please collect the flies. Lovely I place. I'll show you the photos later. What's important is, you know, we, whether you're tracks or any other organisation, you do your work, which is the span of the bridge, Brunel's Bridge, where it is wide. And then these field trips are where you kind of focus the conversation. And uh, I think that's what I, I would see, that the sections in the middle are, are, are a field trip rather than necessarily a meeting. But, mm. you know, and I, I, I'm a great fan of Patrick Geddes. He invented the thing Local Work Global in 1886. He said, by living we... By living, uh, by breathing, we sorry. By learning, we live. By leaves, we breathe. And it means you've got to go out there, and you've got to have this conversation. And so I think these field trips are the leads by which we breathe these these cross disciplinary teams. And you know, I understand having been watching Denmark ever since I was first a mud logger in Os uh, in 1978. I've been coming backwards and forwards to Denmark. And there's a great will to integrate from engineering to geoscience here. There's a great will from the government, the companies. But Larry Lake and I are sitting here saying, my goodness, we used to say integration 20, 30 years ago. Why are we still talking about this? You know, so I don't think we've solved this issue about bringing geoscientists and engineers together. So hopefully we make another little step. Maybe this is one of your little bridging moments. Bridging moment. Yeah. There we go. Great. Thanks. Any other ah, questions, comments? I see last. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, I, I, 
you know, I noticed that when you describe failure, you very often describe it as being helped on the way by others. Uh, do you think that's a general thing that you need to involve people outside? You need to involve people with other experiences to really be able to fail properly, or, or, or do you think that 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 groups themselves can can uh, can fail? <coughs> I think you need someone outside, but it has to be outside the team. It could be the person in the next room. I mean, we had a bit of this in share research times when we, we got inventors to come along. And I have to say, it was just a bit useless, I felt. Um, I mean, because they hadn't got a clue what was going on. It was just nuts. You know, they <laughs> it was too different. It was too different. But it, it just has to be someone who's, who's got something to share who's outside the team, because they can spot. It's the, it's the heuristics and bias thing. Um, you can never spot it yourself, but someone else spots it in seconds. Mm. Uh, and it can be the person in the next office. Yep. All right, we are just on time for the yeah. lunch. So please, let's give the speakers a hand. And